say the issue of WeChat, but Vijay, coming back to you a little bit, just uh, uh, Visa is a little daunting for people. And I think it's daunting because no one really knows exactly what the insides of this organization are. Would you say that approaching Visa is the same methodology as the other two panelists have talked about? What's the right way for a company to in, engage and interface and then potentially either find partnerships or acquisitions? Um, so a couple of points. Uh, you know, I'm just curious, how much? What, what's the headcount of VMware? So 14,000, 9,000, we have 7,000. So we're actually not a very big company <laughs> um, in terms of headcount. I mean, we're the smallest headcount on this panel. Um, that, that's mine's, small, mine's smaller. You're smaller. <laughs> <laughs> um, so um, we are learning how to partner as we are learning how to be a public company, having only been public for four years. And um, we have um, a group which, um, for the communications guys, has got a kind of a weird name. It's called the CDMA Group. I'm kind of part of that group. CDMA uh, stands for Corporate Development and Mergers and Acquisitions. Um, and it drives me crazy because I have a bit of a software background. <laughs> um, so, so we do have a, a group that has Corporate Development M&A, and then we have a BD group. And Business Development and Corporate Development are two different things for us. They're separate. And I'll try to explain the difference. Um, business Development is you partner. Corporate development is you use your balance sheet. So corporate dev for us means we're writing a check, and that's why it's connected to M&A. Whereas BD is, we'll, we'll do a partnership with you. And um, we will always go through this build, partner, buy framework if we present anything to management. And, and we have to go through all three of those um, b before we get anywhere. So in terms of coming to us, um, you can either come through the BD world, which goes through our product groups, uh, or you can come through where I sit, which is CDMA strategy. But we're a small enough organization that we can put you in the right place very quickly. So given that it's so small, um, does the uh, this strategy, what you build, what you buy, what you sort of initiatives you focus on, is it top down? Is it product group driven? Is is there some mandate that your group has that hey, this year or the next two years we're going to be in this business to figure out the right way? So how does that work? So um, we, as I mentioned earlier, we're a growth company. Um, we're, we're growing, you know, as I said, revenues at 10, 15 percent, earnings at 20 percent. Um, we can do part of that organically, and our organic um, growth comes out of two areas. One is we have a secular shift in the United States that is cash and check moving on to card. And that's a massive secular shift because 60% of all transfers in this country are still done on cash or check. And that is growing still at a rapid double digit rate. And then we have, in the developing world, um, we have people who are discovering credit cards and discovering debit cards. And those secular shifts in the developing world give us about 40% revenue growth, and about 50% of our revenue is outside of the US and outside of Europe, so it's in. Eastern Europe, South America, and Asia. And in the US, we get maybe 50 points from the, that secular shift. The other piece is new products and acquisitions. And the third piece is a gap. And the gap has to be filled from innovation internally and acquisitions. So I think it's important for somebody approaching us to try to understand that we are trying to fill a gap, and how can you help us get there? But I would argue, since a lot of new people have come on board, um, we are trying to make it a lot easier to interact with Visa, um, and I would encourage anyone here to just contact me. I, I work with the guys in BizDev, CorpDev, m and on a daily basis, and we are trying to make it much easier. Is, is, one last question for you. Do you think Visa is a technology company? So, um, you know, Visa, I think it's a technology company. So if I ask that question inside the company, I'll get a ton of answers. Uh, I'll get three major answers. Uh, one is we're a brand company. The other one is we're a trusted information broker because really we're all about authentication. Uh, and the third one is we're a technology company. You know, there's about 15 minutes or so of time left, and I think there was some people in the audience who wanted to ask questions. Yes. Michael, for you to come here. My question is for Vijay. So tell us the 
impact of e-money, near field communication, and the entire infrastructure that's needed for the uh, near field communication through the phones. And then you have to have a terminal uh, which acts as a reader and as well as the entire backend infrastructure for authentication. How is that? How are you coping with that? Because there is a tremendous change coming, especially in Japan, Singapore, Hong Kong, where cash is completely disappearing because you just tap your uh, cell phone and uh, likewise, uh, more and more, uh, merchants now want to have a single terminal instead of multiple terminals. And there are other companies jumping into the LA and it's creating an opportunity and I would not name those companies, I'm sure you know them. So tell us how is that impacting your business and how you're coping with it. Um, so the question actually has two elements to it. One is the e-money and the e-wallet uh, portion of it, and the other part is just NFC, and I'll just tackle them separately. So um, you know, e-wallets and being able to pay with tapping your phone is something which is very real and um, will be coming very soon. Um, that is something which we are embracing in, in a big way. We have our own wallet, it's called V.me, um, but we also work with other wallet providers um, and we're open in that world. For the first time, we actually, in our own wallet, can allow you to pay with MasterCard or American Express who are our traditional competitors. So the tapping of the phone and the e-infrastructure and the e-wallet is on its way and, and we're part of that. There's a lot of initiatives. I remember back in the 2000 era, you know, there was uh, the portal craze, you guys all remember that, and everybody was a portal, and the portal was gonna be the solution to everything. In the payments world, it's all about wallets. Everybody has a wallet. The telcos have a consortium called ISIS, which is Verizon, AT&T, um, and Vodafone. Uh, there are a ton of wallets, and we don't know which wallet's gonna win, how they're all gonna play out, um, and right now there are actually, frankly, too many wallets. On the NFC side of it, um, we and others are very um, careful about protecting the data as it travels from your phone to the point of sale terminal. So something as simple as Bluetooth is something we wouldn't trust. Starbucks has a very successful payment app that many of you might have used, which goes through the cloud and then pays through the point of sale. Again, it's not encrypted. It doesn't actually follow the kind of PCI encryption that we would want it to see. And that's where NFC comes in. The issue with NFC is that the chips are very expensive. Um, nobody has rolled out enough NFC phones to make it a different, to make a difference. Um, what we're all waiting for on the NFC front is really Apple. So if the iPhone 5 has <laughs> NFC embedded, that will give it enough momentum that we feel the market will take off very quickly. And then the last piece on point of sales infrastructure is that point of sale terminal is quickly becoming an iPad or an iPhone or an Android phone which also will have, it, have an NFC chip in it. So today people don't believe that NFC has been successful we believe that it's, it's coming. I think we need to have a separate conversation. There are so much information you said. I have a big happy to so. um, Any other questions? <clears throat> this question probably applies to the one for those who have multiple business units in your organization. So each business unit probably is looking at certain m and targets, right? And within your organization, there's some kind of prioritization that has to happen as to, okay, across those, which do we go after? Can you talk a little bit about how you go about doing that within your organizations? Well, the first question, I think, is do you have, do you have M&A targets? Is that even a term you guys use? Yeah, no, we don't have, uh, I mean, the, so short answer is no, we don't have any M&A targets. So when we get opportunities, we would look at them. There are probably two nuanced, uh, subtext answers to that. One is we do have OPEX targets. So as a company, we obviously publish numbers to the street and we need to kind of be within those envelopes. So as we do M&A, as we bring heads in, etc., we do monitor what that does to OPEX. And so there's some level of um, a, a balancing act that we have to follow based on that. So we can't just suddenly go and buy a company with 3,000 heads without knowing how that is going to happen. Now, of course, this in particular applies to diluted companies. If they are treated, then it's obviously less of an issue. Uh, the second thing is uh, we do, as part of the planning process, we actually look at 
what it is that uh, businesses would want to spend both on a capital side as well as uh, on an uh, operational side. And so we do look at that as a benchmark for what we might embark on. So it's not a hard guideline. It's not like we have to stop m and when we reach a certain number or, or something like that. But we have some sense of whether we are breaking the bank or whether we are on track to what we what the business had actually proposed that they were going to do. And if they're too too far off from that, we do ask the questions that we ask. Okay, Eddie. Yeah, so let me add uh, something here. So from an M&A standpoint, again, no, no annual targets or anything or no business level targets that you need to get a certain amount of revenue or or EPS driven by your M&A strategy. Because again, our, our strategy tends to be focused more on the technology side of the house, right? So, so uh, that's that's how that plays out. But uh, in terms of uh, rationalizing things across business units, right? We do have a, an annual strategy process that we go through where business units will outline some of their key strategic initiatives, the key pillars of their strategy, where the gaps are, and there is a, a rationalization, a prioritization across the corporation that does happen. And, and then that, uh, we can take that and drive sort of uh, some of the m and activity uh, based on that. There's always something that happens sort of more, uh, it's contextual or something that comes up and you have to respond to it. But there is a, strate a strategic aspect uh, to this as well. I know we've been talking a lot about M&A, but we spend a lot of time looking at other tools in our in our sort of toolkit, if you will, from an inorganic uh, approach standpoint, right? We might be looking at technology uh, uh, assets that we will try to acquire. We are looking at uh, uh, licensing as a, as a means to get access to certain components. We are looking at joint ventures, uh, OEM, reseller type partnerships. So there is a variety of different ways to, to drive the corporate agenda, uh, m &A being just one of uh, many. Um, question just from me, and, and we'll go to the audience again. Should a young company take money from a strategic? Should you let the strategic inside your house before it's fully built? Of course. I think, I mean, I'd give you my perspective. My sense is that if you are sure of your alignment, then the answer is yes. If you're just, I mean, for example, we as VMware would have no real interest in investing money. Uh, I mean, we are, we are very different from VCs in one very critical dimension, which is if we invest whatever, a couple of million dollars now and it comes back as six a year later, that probably is uninteresting. Right. Uh, uh, well, maybe even 16 <laughs> or 20 or 50, whatever, pick, take your pick. Uh, on the other hand, if we put a couple of million dollars now and three years from now, it's actually created a business that is generating revenue that's, even if it's like $20 million business at that point in time, that becomes very interesting for us as a growth engine for the future. Right. So it's a very different outlook. It is longer term. It is something which is more uh, focused on creating a business for us or aiding and assisting an existing business. So I'd say that if you take money from whatever me or VMware or our company, it should be one where you feel like your path is actually quite aligned with what you want to do and that you feel like, I mean, certainly feel like we could be a potential acquirer because there'd definitely be that angle. And if that's not there, it probably doesn't make sense to do it. Because, I mean, for one, we may not do it anyway. But if that alignment is not there, it's probably more a hindrance than it is a help on both sides. Um, yeah, I, I'm going to answer that from two hats. Yeah, one hat is I've been CFO of three companies where we took strategic money. In the first company, we sold to the strategic. Uh, in the second instance, um, SAP was our strategic, and they became our channel for our product. And in the third instance, um, we were able to get um, a fair amount of revenue from those. I think as long as with my CFO startup hat on, you have the strategic at a minority state, 10% or less, where they can influence you, uh, I think it's a great thing. It's validation for your customers, it's validation for your investors, and it's a potential M&O link. Um, we at Visa have taken um, a stake in a company called Square, which is driving a real revolution in the payment space in terms of acceptance where credit cards were never before accepted in micro merchants. Um, and we have a minority stake, um, but we like it because we get to see what they're doing. Um, so I am a big fan of the strategic stake on both sides. How did that help Square here? Well, I think that Square had a massive validation when Visa invested in, in, in the company. So when they, the branding of it. 
branding. And it's the validation. The technology must be good if we invested in it. Technology company, but we do six trillion dollars of payments, and they're payments company, so yeah, that's not a bad thing. Um, any other questions from the audience? No, I guess you guys did a great job. Um, okay, I, don't, I, I think there's many conversations that you can have with them as they're here for the next few minutes, and hopefully the next you know half an hour or so as this event goes on. Um, but it was a good introduction to three new charter members, and thank you so much all for coming. Thank you. For Thank you very much. Another round of applause for um, our panel. So speaking, speaking of Corp Dev and, and business uh, or M&A, uh, we, we do have some special guests in the audience today. I wanted to point them out. Uh, the Budney brothers are here in the audience. Uh, I forgot where they're seated. They were here. I don't know if they heard it. So they're still around. I think maybe one of them sent a phone call. Uh, but as you know, the Budney family uh, were pioneers in the IT services space. And last year they had a massive acquisition of $1.2 billion by IG, So. If you see them here in the audience, please say hello to them. Um, the other thing is, when, when we were planning this discussion, uh, and uh, you know, the panelists were asking me, well, what does the audience want to hear, et cetera, et cetera, and how do we frame all of this? One thing I pointed out to them was that this is a peer discussion. Yes, we're talking about them because they're new CMs and their roles in companies and so on. But as a group of CMs, this room, including uh, people on both sides of the podium here, represent the cream of the crop here in. Silicon Valley. So th this is something that's very special that Ty has created that you are all a part of. And we desperately need more people like you in our organization. So I, I put this in every email I always send out, and then I'm still going to ask all of you to nominate one new, highly qualified, successful CM uh, who is not just successful in their professional career, but also has the same spirit of giving that all of you do in this room as well. So that's my call to action. We have six months left. I want to see one nomination from all of you before the end of the year. Uh, but with that, let's wrap it up and enjoy the rest of the evening at work. Good night, everybody.